Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for tuning in to our webcast today. I hope your week is treating you well so far. I'm Cheryl Rogers, the Marketing Director at Golden Helix, and today we have Gabe Rudy, our Vice President of Product and Engineering, and Gabe is going to discuss handling and analyzing the growing volumes of genomic data. Take it away, Gabe. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm really excited today to talk about uh, big data in genomics and at Golden Helix, and how Golden Helix has been focused on meeting these needs of the, the, the demands of both clinical and research genomics, and the scaling of that process. So as a as a agenda today, I wanted to, for those who may not have a, a lot of background about Golden Helix, give you just the two-minute World War II tour, talk about who we are and the products we build. Um, and that will come into play because although I want to spend some time talking about big data and genomics in general and just give uh, the background and what I see is the as the major trends there. Uh, I really believe in showing and not just telling. So let's go ahead at the after that and walk through um, all three of uh, Golden Helix's main products here and how they are handling big data, both in terms of a number of samples we're looking at, the number of variants we're analyzing, uh, the just total size of the data sets being worked on. And as we wrap up, we'll talk about how these use cases, um, although it may look like we're only talking about sort of the upper limits of things, uh, matter no matter what size a group you are, whether you're a small lab, large lab, working alone, working in a big consortium. Um, in fact, a lot of these things are applicable uh, no matter what. And We'll spend some time at the end taking questions, so feel free to use the GoToMeeting question dialog to enter them in as we go, and uh, we'll spend at least a couple minutes. But um, as uh, as outlined, I do have a lot to cover, so this may, I hope to and keep you engaged. The, the the full hour here and just looking at who's um, attending this webinar. We certainly have a mix of people and hopefully there'll be something to, to learn and enjoy across all of these different topics. So Golden Helix is probably one of the the, um, the longest running maturest bioinformatics company around in the sense that we were started in 1998. We had some initial investment and uh, sponsorship by GlaxoSmithKline, but quickly focused on supporting the genomic research space and now more so the clinical uh, genomic space. And through the evolution of technology, uh, we have uh, had a series of products in development, and now our flagship products are Varseq, which is our uh, single sample and, and cohort-oriented NGS sample uh, workflow tool, where we allow to support filtering, annotating, authoring clinical reports, and running your workflows in an automated pipeline mode that you can put into a high-throughput environment. We'll also be uh, uh, talking today about Warehouse, which sort of goes hand-in-hand -hand with Varseek, which is our uh, server-oriented variant store, so you can have a centralized repository, multi-user access for things like your uh, samples, annotations about those samples, hosted reports, a place to integrate with all your other systems. Um, our long-running research platform for doing statistical analysis and supporting various research workflows is SNP and Variation Suite, a very mature piece of technology, and we'll be talking about it today in the context of agrigenomics, a very uh, exciting and growing field that we are happy to be supporting as well. So over the years, we've been honored to, to work with various different institutions, and we really believe part of our, um, our secret is essentially how closely we consider our relationship with our customers and how we consider everything an iterative process and really understanding their needs and building out uh, what we see as the, as the next thing. And, and what we're talking about today is really about pushing those bounds, and a lot of our customers have, have really um, also pushing the bounds of what can be done with genomics. Um, and so that is essentially um, what makes Golden Helix great is, is the partnership between us focused on what we do, building great tools and supporting them, um, and to supporting their efforts to do genomic research and clinical genomics. And that research has resulted in a lot of publications, and so we've been cited by 
I, I think it's exciting to talk about the, the number because we just passed the thousand uh, mark where uh, over a thousand uh, citations in peer-reviewed journals uh, mention the use of our software. So it's definitely a tried and true methodology and one was, uh, that is based on the fact that um, just like we talked about being iterative with our customers, we're also very open in our methodology. When we push the limits like we are talking about today, um, we are not just building a black box algorithm. We're documenting every single aspect of the math. If you look in our manuals, you'll see the formulas for what we did, we're talking about in terms of our, our, um, our, our, our new innovative matrix math that we'll be talking about at the end. Um, and when we do learn things by aggregating the knowledge of supporting all these customers, we, uh, we try to share that with the community and we have things like ebooks, etc. So what you're getting with Golden and Helix is um, a tried and true mature technology stack um, and a support team and a, uh, a product team that's really about trying to uh, focus on your success and making you successful involves um, essentially not worrying about things like per sample fees. We don't do that. We just have a very simple uh, licensing model based on um, a yearly subscription and then we want you to be able to use the software as much as you can. Um, so when we're talking about big data and genomics, let's talk about the, the final result here, and that is essentially making sure there are actionable clinical information that can be helpful in a precision medicine way. And so in cancer, that's often helping guide treatment of cancer. What are the appropriate drugs, potentially molecular targeting drugs that uh, can be a significant better course than, say, um, broad spectrum chemotherapy. Um, and often in hereditary genetics, it's finding that diagnosis and ending those diagnosis odysseys. Um, and the process of doing this really requires everything uh, preceding all those preceding steps lining up and being both efficient, high quality, and, and achievable in the context of, of a clinical group and, and, and the resources available to them. So if you look at the, the production of data, it really is sort of a stepping down by orders of magnitude from the very raw form to the uh, completely refined final product. Uh, which is essentially the clinical report, which might just be a piece of paper or a PDF. Um, next generation sequencing is based on the premise that we chop up the genome into tiny little bits, sequence those little bits, and then assemble those based on the backbone of a reference sequence, and then call the differences from that reference and focus on that. So we go from, in the case of whole genome sequencing, uh, 100 gigabytes or potentially hundreds of gigabytes, depending on the depth that something is sequenced, um, of raw data to the aligned data being the same size, it's the same information, just tagging where it is in the genome and, and sorted and ordered appropriately, to looking at those regions and finding the differences. Um, and in this context, we're talking about finding the events that are high quality and we're talking about variations that are high quality and assessing the quality and quantifying the quality of those mutations so that can all be used in further steps. A GVCF file produced on a genome or even an exome is about two to five gigabytes, so this contains those mutations. Also, the, it contains great information between those mutations, kind of aggregating some summary about how much um, those regions have been covered so we know if we're not calling a mutation, we know that there is at least a good section of the genome that's covered with um, reference bases, et cetera, so we can essentially have um, information between our mutations. All that on a per sample level can be brought in and this is where this red box is where we focus on. Um, the process of annotating those variants against the knowledge base of all known clinical mutations, all known variants that have been cataloged in population catalogs, which we'll spend some time talking about today. Um, and this is, a, this is the part that changes dynamically. Every month there's new mutations known, there's new catalogs being brought to, to, into the public uh, uh, sphere, um, and the process in which you might customize and build something like a clinical report um, may change more rapidly than that, especially just given the nature of every time you see a sample you might learn something new that needs to go into a knowledge base, and tomorrow you might be able to see another sample that takes advantage of that information. Um, so while we're talking about, you know, know, big data, we often think about these uh, 
these these very distributed in nature, highly paralyzed, uh, specialized infrastructure. Um, and genomics is a bit of a different beast because the algorithms that do all this part are very mature, they, they're very stable, um, and they can run and take advantage of a uh, modern server that has lots of cores, lots of RAM. Um, a single whole genome can be aligned and called on a single server. It might take a day or so, but it is paralyzable across servers given the fact that uh, the, the biology is, is broken up into discrete units like, gene, like chromosomes and you can treat those individually and there are tricks to do that. When we're talking about things like exomes and gene panels, this whole set of uh, examples gets reduced by orders of magnitude um, and, and, you know, and exomes sort of being in between the very simplistic uh, or the, the smaller scale two orders of magnitude less gene panel and the whole genomes. So that often is embedded and runs on the compute power that's built right into the sequencer in the case of gene panels. Um, but this part actually, again, starts to get more more like big data because not only are you taking information about your one sample, but you need to compare it to all the samples you've ever seen plus all the knowledge bases that we have collected um, as a community as, as, as we progress science forward. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is these knowledge bases, bringing that information in, working with large numbers of samples, large numbers of variants. Um, and over time we have certainly amassed these catalogs. So uh, dbSNP, for example, uh, has over time gone from less than 20 million variants to over 150. It is the catalog, uh, it's called SNP, but it's really a catalog of all small variation in the human genome that has been publicly uh, researched and submitted. Um, and then ClinVar is the catalog of all mutations that have some assessment or classification against human phenotypes. So they'll th say things like this mutation is pathogenic in this form of hereditary cardiomyopathy, etc. Um, and this lab asserted that in they saw it in this sample, or not necessarily a specific sample, but the assertion may be a reference to a citation or a publication. Over time, ClinVar has grown from about 50,000 assertions to um, over 200,000. Um, they've cleaned it up at some points and there's still more cleanup to do, but this number you would expect to continue to grow. The other thing that's really been growing is the number of samples that are in publicly accessible catalogs. And of course, the more diversity, the better in terms of being able to see when you're looking at your own potentially novel mutation in your own samples, uh, have I ever, has this ever been seen before in potentially healthy people? You don't expect healthy people to be walking around with mutations that are highly penetrant or maybe um, highly pathogenic or, or mutagenic. Um, so if we are looking at the number of samples cataloged in these public resources, we have things like thousand genomes, back in 2012, 2013, they had their phase one release, they had a thousand samples, took a couple years, but then they increased the number of whole genomes here to 2,500 samples. You can see the number of variants here is quite large. In fact, this what this big bump is here is largely accounting for um, the fact that 1,000 genomes reposit, deposited all of their variants in dbSNP. Um, and then outside of genomes, some groups decided that it would be better to focus resources uh, on, a, on a more cost-effective per sample mode on exomes. And so the NHLBI collected 6,500 exomes with about two million variants, and a couple years ago, uh, the Broad cataloged most of those, plus a lot of other exomes, into a massive catalog of 60,000 samples. So we get a sense of sort of the upper bound in terms of the cohort size people have been doing so far, 60,000 samples. Um, and if you want to catch up on the latest of anything, of course, you turn to Twitter, and just yesterday, um, we got a tweet that Exact is actually going to be pushing this. They might be announcing this at ASHG, um, but they think they, uh, but the, the word is on the Twitter sphere that uh, the version 2 Exact is almost doubling or more than doubling those counts, and we might have 120,000 exomes cataloged. Um, so that's fantastic. I mean, that allows you to get down to extremely, extremely rare variants, um, and that is extremely important from an annotation perspective. Of course, you need tools that can take that much data and annotate it and bring it together and keep track of those versions of all these sources over time. So that's what we're going to talk about next, is uh, give you a little show and tell of these, these products of, of Golden Helix and how they specifically handle these large number of variants, these large number of samples, and they scale from your needs as a, as a small lab 
all the way up to your needs as a large consortium competing at these scales of these public groups. Might be working on your own data, it might not be public, but you certainly want to be able to get to those size data sets as well. So let's start off with Varseq. Um, so Varseq is, uh, and we're going to talk about whole genomes in, in Varseq. So Varseq as a tool has matured and been adopted in a lot of different uh, genomic workflow contexts and, and often is, is very popular with labs starting to handle gene panels um, and exomes. Um, but genomes, I think, are a up and coming trend and, and here's why I wanted to sort of talk about them. Um, it may just be a matter of time between now and when the cost of genomes drops below the cost of exomes. Exomes cost more money than just um, their sequencing run because you actually have to capture the exons from all of your uh, fragments of DNA. That capturing process is about you know, designing a kit, and there's various ones from different uh, vendors here, Agilent, Nimblegen, Illumina, that we're going to talk about. Uh, and that kit grabs an exon and pulls it down or, or somehow isolates that fragment of DNA um, of these coding portions of the genome. It's only a couple percentage of the total uh, length of the genome. But then it has to amplify that before it goes to the sequencing process, and it uses a PCR reaction to do that. Um, one of the downsides to that is that if you have uh, exons that have a high portion of their, of their sequence containing Gs or Cs, um, that PCR reaction is less efficient, so you actually get less coverage over those regions. And similarly, if you have very, very, very low portions of Gs and Cs, it starts to be a little bit re um, um, hard to sequence and uh, also hard, uh, difficult to get those amplified regions. So this is a comparison of all these kits. Um, it's a normalization of six samples across all these six, these kits, and you can see that the, the, the coverage across these different um, categorizations of exons can be quite erratic. Um, and so one thing about moving to whole genomes is that you actually reduce some of this bias. You have less sensitivity to the GC content because you're just taking the raw DNA of a lot of cells, fragmenting and sequencing it without necessarily a PCR reaction. The other thing you get is potentially a more uniform coverage and potentially to get regions of the genome uh, that are intronic or or intergenic that are of clinical interest. Um, there are downsides though, other than the cost, and it's just a matter of time, I would hope that the cost starts to become um, uh, not a downside. Uh, you are often sequencing at lower coverage exomes. You might be sequencing 150 reads cover every region on average. That's great. You get a lot of extra uh, confidence when you're calling mutations in that region. Um, a, a genome might have 50 on average, but then given variability, it might drop down quite a bit lower than that or higher than that, depending on the region. If you're looking at tumors, it's probably a no-go because you often need to sequence at much higher read depths, tens of thousands of reads, to be able to, ice, to, 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 to sample the portion of your cells that have that um, uh, tumor oriented uh, that are tumors or cells and that have your mutations and there might be not all of your cells have the mutations so you need to be sequencing quite high read depths um, and also according to this publication which has this this uh, graph as well they looked at which regions uh, contain uh, the pathogenic or known clinical variants and exon kits have been optimized to try to capture these regions. Only about 0.5% of all of the variants in HGMD and ClinVar are not in these standard kits, uh, covered by those kits. And of course, there may be sort of a looking under the lamppost effect where we find the variants because we're looking at exomes, and that's why the variants that are clinically significant are not being found. But uh, currently, there's not a lot of known clinical variants outside of this region. The final question is, you know, can you handle whole genome sequencing in your tools? Well, let's talk about Varsi because we certainly can do that. The other thing you need to do inside, uh, if you are looking outside of these exonic regions, is provide meaningful annotations. Um, Varsi has some answers here. Outside of the coding regions, you're starting to look for things like, is this evolutionary constrained? Do we have conservation information? Are there other, you know, assessments about genetic uh, phenotype? links, that's things like ClinVar, et cetera. Um, you can look at things like splice site predictions, we have those as well. Um, and there may be other common variants that are deeply intergenic that are useful from a clinical perspective, PGX variants that uh, indicate sensitivity to drugs, et cetera. 
What we also have in uh, VARSEQ CAD scores, which are a combined, um, essentially, del deleteriousness score that includes a lot of this information, regulatory information, splice site information, conservation information, etc., into one combined score. And these scores are whole genome. They cover the uh, every single base of the genome, every single mutation will get a score. And um, you can use that to help rank or, or sort or filter um, variants, regardless of whether they are exonic or not. All right, to look at genomes, um, I could just pull up a couple of public samples from, say, 1,000 genomes, but uh, I think a more interesting example would be to pull up some uh, interesting samples and some interesting people. And these are an amazing group of 17 people, supercentenarians, 110 or older uh, surviving folks with no uh, chronic conditions that were sequenced by this this group at Stanford and their data was made public. So this is uh, complete genomics, whole genome sequencing, one male, 16 females. Now, if you look for the uh, the the golden key to longevity in genomics, it's not. There's no smoking gun here. There's no. There's no. I guess the opposite of a smoking gun. Um, but they did find a couple interesting. They had a couple different strategies. They were looking for. Are there any you know interesting pathogenic variants? And they found one in DCS. Uh, DSC2, and are there any genes that have sort of a high burden of, of uh, or a low burden of mutations compared to the reference population? So sort of counting rare variants, functional variants by genes. So let's go ahead and, and pull up VARSEQ, work with these samples, and repeat this kind of analysis. I think it would be fun. So we're going to do that, and uh, to demonstrate VARSEQ, I'm going to pop on over to uh, the latest version we have here. Um, and I'm going to assume you have either some ver some experience with VARSEQ or uh, this, if this is your first experience, um, I'm going to stay pretty light on, on the complex things and just stick with the basics. Um, basically, once we import data into VARSEQ, we have a single table containing all of the samples, here's the 17 samples, and all the variants, and then we add annotations, like I say add annotation here, and using our public repository we'll get down to things like these population catalogs, these assessment catalogs, uh, clinical assertions, very straightforward to add these things, and they show up as extra groups of columns, and so you can see as I scroll over, we have our gene annotations, that shows me which gene I'm in, we have things like our uh, ClinVar uh, annotations, um, our CAD scores, these population catalogs, etc. We also have things like ClinVar, and of course most variants in this giant set uh, do not have uh, ClinVar assertions. Uh, but I can scroll through this whole genome data set very smoothly. I'm working with 14 million variants, and you'd think I'd open an Excel spreadsheet that just contains a couple hundred rows. Um, this data set's obviously larger than what fits in memory. Varsic's very efficient at pulling in just what it needs. We're also showing just um, the first sample here, and that's how Varsic is oriented. You sort of drill down on one sample at a time. But there's no reason I can't display more than that. Let's go ahead and swap this over to display all samples. Now I just have sort of a group of column for each of the 17 samples. Maybe I actually want to focus on um, making this nice dense version of this here and swap it over to be collated by fields so I can see um, all of my um, genotypes or something first and then actually I kind of prefer this way but you can kind of choose how you want to display your data here. The other thing that we're doing is running an algorithm that we're going to talk about later um, in the context of warehouse, etc., that counts information across all of those samples about how many times we see, you know, non-reference genotypes. So if we see a mutation, it's either in a heterozygous state or a homozygous state. This variant occurs in three of the 17 in a heterozygous state, so it has a little count of three. This one occurs in three in a homozygous state, has a little count of six. Six out of uh, essentially 17 times two. We get a ratio. We get a percentage. Or, or an allelic frequency here. This is the kind of frequency you want to use from an analysis perspective. We're going to talk about this later when we talk about lots of samples or even just a number of samples in a clinical context. You really want to be able to catalog your samples and get this type of computation. I mention this because these same algorithms that run here on these 17 samples are the same algorithms that run in warehouse on um, tens of thousands of samples. Okay, so let's do some analysis. They said that they found that uh, there are uh, surprisingly some pathogenic variants here in ClinVar. So I'm going to right click on this and say create a filter based on this clinical significance column of ClinVar. You can click on any header here and get information about 
where ClinVar is. This is coming from the which version of ClinVar, the whole information about where it came from, when we downloaded it, etc. Um, if there was a new version of ClinVar, we can we would prompt you to say, do you want to update to that? We have versioned histories of everything. Um, here we go. We got a nice little group of all the different classifications, and we get numbers here of our 14 million. We can immediately see up oh, there's 200 and so that are. I can click on that to see what that, those 228 are. I can click on my final result to just always track the result of my filtering. And I'm going to say, let's look at the likely pathogenic pathogenic. So now I'm starting to see, OK, there's some somewhat not interesting looking stuff, not specified, not provided. Well, ClinVar also has this review status. If I click on this, I can actually, OK, it tells you what the review status information is. Um, and that there's essentially. Um, uh, a, a filtering process where they say whether something was classified by one of their authenticated lab submitters versus it was sort of just brought in by bulk an annotation from some previous database. We want to focus on uh, essentially variants that came in from labs. So we're going to filter on uh, review status as well, look at things that have been one, two, or three starred. Three stars is reviewed by an extra panel. That'd be really interesting to see some of these variants. Um, you could see things like warfarin response, uh, Lynch syndrome, et cetera, that uh, would be interesting to follow there. So we have 113 variants. We might also look at uh, information about, OK, are any of these likely to really change the impact of our, of, our, of our protein. A lot of these are missense mutations. Some missense mutations are, are less penetrant than others, but there's some loss of function mutations in here too. Frame shift variants, stop gain variants. Let's just grab those. So I'm create a filter on those, and I can grab these uh, loss of function mutations and see these remaining 10 variants. Okay, so now we're getting down to um, seeing what's going on in just these 10 variants. And there's that DSC2. Um, and I could drill down on that, get more details on that. Um, I could also do things like, uh, in this case, let's just export this as a spreadsheet and, and send this off um, to Stanford to see if they notice that there's some new ClinVard mutations uh, that since they last published this, this paper, which was a couple years ago, maybe they want to see that. So I'm going to grab export this, very quick export, open this in an Excel file, um, creates a nice file here, and all those, uh, in, in everything that you customize in Varseq, how you display, how you collate fields, which fields you display from different annotation sources, that all comes through here in the Excel file, including things like the uh, documentation about fields and the hyperlinks to the clinical assertions from ClinVar. So a fantastic way to analyze data. These are often used in, in, in the clinical context to, um, to, to export data that you might um, either use in a different tool or uh, share for someone who's not using Varseq to, um, to, to look at the data as well. Um, I wanted to also talk about getting to that level of, of groups of genes and counts per genes. That kind of analysis can be done too, and in, in a cohort-specific way, whether you're looking at 17 samples or 100 samples. Um, looking at the time here, I want to be making sure we cover all of our product bases. I did this in the dry run, but I'm going to cut it out now just to save time, but point you to this so you have a sense that we do have algorithms like allelic counts that that go across samples, um, and this one is called aggregate filtered variants, and it essentially um, grabs information from a filtering process, which I would say, if I was repeating what they did in the paper, we would look at rare variants by those population catalogs, and then look at um, filtering on something like zygosity, looking at only mutations present in a sample, and then this aggregate count would create a table on a gene level that says, um, for this gene, how many uh, variants were present, uh, how many samples had variants in that gene, et cetera. So you could pull that kind of table up. And then, you know, uh, VARSEQ is not a statistical tool. You could pull up something like SPS to do burden tests. But certainly, you can work with whole genome data sets um, and do those type of analyses as well. So I promised big data, and so I want to just touch on essentially a couple uh, examples of those upper bounds. We mentioned dbSNP being the catalog of uh, known mutations, uh, small variations in the human genome, and especially uh, even other species, but dbSNP for the human catalog has 150 variants these days. Um, you can see I actually ran a little filter and immediately ran here. I've already filtered down to just the, um, these are their annotations for deletions and insertions and multinucleotide variants, one of the columns here. I could turn that filter off, get back to 
my 150 million variants, which I have now. I can scroll through these 150 million variants, um, very smooth. So this type of analysis scales in VARSeq to these upper bounds in terms of all mutations um, present or, or cataloged uh, in public databases. We also have large numbers of samples. So we mentioned uh, 1,000 Genomes has 2,500 samples. That's the la largest matrix of genotypes that are public. Those exome projects for patient privacy information do not release the, the genotypes of their, their 6,000 or 60,000 exomes. But we can open up these uh, 2,500 samples and scroll through this kind of matrix plus add annotations. Again, kind of upper bounds in terms of number of samples. I mean, you could certainly come up with more, but you can see how effortless this is for, for Varsic to work with. And just to give you a sense of the matrix that we're actually scrolling through here in terms of data size, um, we're storing this in a compressed columnar store format. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about that, I have blog posts and we had a, our original warehouse webcast. We talked about how efficient this is. This is the same back end that's used in our warehouse server. This data here for this large matrix um, is about 40 gigabytes compressed. Uncompressed, this is about it, and essentially in the form that you visualize it as we as we scroll through it, um, about 800 gigabytes of data. So we're really in the almost terabyte sized. You wouldn't think you would be able to work with this so interactively, but no. that's that's big data at Golden Helix. All right, so um, touching now on our our next product. So this infrastructure that you're seeing, scrolling through thousands of samples, hundreds of millions of variants, annotating, running these algorithms, computing counts across tens of thousands of samples, um, being able to add any annotation from any version of any annotation source, that's the infrastructure behind VS Warehouse. What we essentially did is just compile that down to a form that works in the back end of a server and provide an interface for this to be a multi-user environment to add your samples over time to really Really keep track of everything that you could possibly generate at a lab. So that's all of your NGS samples, plus all of your uh, assertions that you might type in or understand a variant and you say this variant is pathogenic in this disease, um, as well as the things like your, your, what you produce, your reports, and annotating those or, or cataloging those not just as uh, a PDF, which we also can, can store the, the HTML and PDF version of those, but also the, uh, the tabular information, the sample level information, the variants that you put in the report, each classification in the report, you can search and annotate and filter those as well. And this makes sense whether you're working on gene panels, exomes, and genomes, and here's why. You gotta treasure your clinical samples. They really are um, your, your greatest resource. And don't think just because Exact has 60,000 exomes that there's no point in looking at your, your dozen or so clinical samples that you have in your repository or, or however many you have. The, the thing to keep in mind is every one of these databases has blind spots. Exomes come computed from exact, are aggregated based on the target captures that they used, um, often older sequencing samples, maybe less uh, read length. You might be using a, uh, a targeted gene panel um, that is more efficient in capturing in clinically valid regions of, the, of, your, of your samples. And so your samples might show up um, what look like novel, completely novel mutations if you were to compare them to exact, or even 1,000 genomes, 1,000 genomes sequence with 75 base pair reads. Uh, MySeq comes with 300 base pairs standard now. Um, and so there are regions of the genome that are completely blank in terms of variants from these repositories, but you might have real clinically valid information there. And as soon as you start to catalog even just a couple dozen samples, you expect when looking for rare variants, you can immediately start to catalog, oh, what is the frequency of these samples in my, my uh, high quality clinical NGS samples. Um, so you really need to treasure your samples, place them in a, put them in a place that is immediately accessible for your analysis. And you can version warehouse stuff so you can, if you need to for clear reasons, um, only update those at quarterly increments but still be able to add samples continuously and then move your annotations um, when you're doing a validation step to the version that needs to be uh, in step with your your CLIA validation, et cetera. And this makes sense whether you're working on cancer samples, germline samples, and the great thing is all this infrastructure 
is accessible without leaving the efficient and uh, uh, workflow oriented interface of VARSEQ. So from VARSEQ you can annotate against your warehouse, you can save your reports back into your warehouse, you can set up these assessment catalogs um, to write your notes about mutations, etc. And that assessment catalog feature is actually something new coming to our latest version of VS Warehouse. We have had these assessment catalog uh, local databases in Varseq for a while, but now these can be kind of seamlessly integrated in, in uh, VS Warehouse where you can uh, select a variant, you can configure these fields, you can write your notes on it. When you save it, it captures the time, the user, you have a history of all previous assessments. This information can be put into a, uh, a workflow where it comes in as an annotation. It can be put into an automated workflow where it auto fills in your fields of your reports, etc. Other things that are in our latest version is we also have improved the uh, import speeds. We've optimized those considerably, especially when adding samples to existing projects. We wanted to make it very easy to add a couple samples to your 10,000 existing. We actually recompute the entire genomic matrix of all unique variants by all samples. Um, and we do that now two to seven times faster than we did before. Um, and that gives you a whole new version. So at any time you can say, um, well, last June I made this assertion about this clinical sample. Well, you can go see what your warehouse looked like last June. You'll see the exact samples plus their annotations from that context. Those were the things that you used in the context of that previous assertion, and you have all that historical information. Um, we've also improved our query speeds, etc. So let's talk about warehouse and start from the context of uh, how this works in a VARSEQ workflow based on sort of a standard clinical uh, cancer gene panel test. And we'll start by connecting to the warehouse server. We'll go through and look at these things like reports and catalogs and annotations. Um, we'll come back and say, okay, now I have some samples that I analyzed from the context of, of Varseq. Maybe I have a, a friend and I say, hey, go and grab these samples and do your own uh, uh, spot check in Excel. Let's go through the process of logging into the server the web interface of warehouse, extracting some, some rare variants from the same set of samples, et cetera. So that's what we're gonna do now. Um, back into Varseq land. Um, so we're gonna open up this uh, MySeq project. So this is a uh, their TrueSight uh, myeloid uh, cancer panel. So it, you can see this is a very standard, this is actually a very kind of standard uh, setup for doing uh, analysis in VARSEQ on clinical sample or, or gene panel samples where you might have a set of filters here. I'm not gonna get into this. If you wanted to see more about this, we have other webcasts where we talk about setting up your work, uh, clinical lab reporting. Uh, we also have a table here. Um, as we click on each variant, we jump to that variant to see where it is in the gene, understand its genomic context. We can even see the high read depth uh, NGS data in its raw form there, etc. cetera. Um, and now we're gonna go and add, integrate this sort of standard interpretation workflow with, uh, with Warehouse. And to do that, I'm gonna go to Tools, Manage VS Warehouse. Um, although I'm showing you this sort of as if we had never touched Warehouse before, normally you would set this up and all this would be sort of integrated into your workflow and you don't have to, to do this more than once. So I'm going to start with here and I've already connected to a server. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the process of like typing in the URL and connecting. But um, this is our internal test server where we're testing, throwing lots of different samples at gene panels and exomes and genomes. And when you, uh, when they add, when I, what, I, what I've done here actually already is I've uh, added the samples from my existing project uh, to that. You just hit next, next, next. It uploads it. It adds it to that project. It creates a new version and integrates it. I'm not going to go through that right now. But we've added these samples from this project um, uh, to, the, to this, uh, the warehouse system. We can also design uh, clinical reports inside of Varseq that we can author and get fully rendered customizable reports. You can customize everything about them from their fields to the rendering. Um, we have other webcasts where we go into that, but Warehouse can also store the version of those reports. And as you work with it, you can and, and integrate that with uh, your Varseq client. This is that new assessment catalog information. I created a cancer catalog here, which contains a couple simple fields. These fields are very customizable. You can see I also have imported 120,000 so variants. What I did is essentially use the ability to bulk import um, 
from any source, a text file, a VCF file, um, your existing knowledge base. Um, and for the sake of just uh, testing those upper limits, I imported the full set of ClinVar assertions. Um, so I added and mapped the ClinVar classification to our classification step, the ClinVar description of the variant to the description step, etc. If I wanted to add another field, it's as simple as saying maybe I want a checkbox here. Um, and I could say this is for the sign off of the lab director. Um, and then it's as simple as that. You can customize these these knowledge bases um, to contain whatever you need and they work as these uh, these versioned annotation sources as well. And uh, so as an annotation source what this looks like is all these projects, all these clinical reports, all these assessment catalogs, I can just columns to my project. And again, once I add this once and save it as my workflow, it's automated. Every new sample I run gets these annotations. So let's add these clinical catalog, this cancer catalog. So that is uh, 125,000 um, clinical assertions being queried against my 800 or so variants from my project. And it brings this in, and you can see these classifications coming in as well. Um, I'm going to do one more so that it's already popped in. I'm going to add one more annotation from, from a, you know, you can do add annotation. You can also see your warehouse here in your standard annotation list. This is where all of your annotations are accessible. Um, so I could add it either way. Um, I'm going to add in annotations for my project. So this is my, my set of, um, let's do my set of 10,000 exomes that I previously have cataloged. And so this is almost instantaneous. Since that's all pre-computed data, I can see the frequency of, of my, uh, my existing current sample of these 20 filtered variants in this assessment catalog here. Um, and finally, I want to be able to potentially do things like um, update these annotations or these, these assessments. So I'm going to hit this open button. That opens a tab um, to, to uh, send the current sample or the current variant. I'm just going to drop this tab over here, right over my um, genome browser window. Oh, I don't want it there. I want it sort of right on top. There you go. So as I click on each variant, I can set up an assessment. And of course, since I've already previously annotated, it's easy to see where I have um, existing information. And if I pull up uh, a table here with existing or a variant with existing information, I could see its history, etc. I can update it. I might want to let's see. This is likely benign for a specific reason, and then it versions that in that that saved information as well. You can see this variant ID is a hyperlink. I can drop right into Warehouse to view that assessment from the context of VS Warehouse. Um, and so here's my current and my historical uh, classifications all within the, the catalog here. And I can actually go and query these, um, oops, it's not very big, um, query these over time and go and, and quickly do things like I want to see all my classifications that are uh, have been pathogenic and, and query my own classifications and go find subsets of them, etc. Okay, so um, that's, that's the perspective from uh, from Varseek. Now let's jump on over to uh, what it might look like to do this type of work uh, if you are outside of Varseek and you're coming into the warehouse through the web interface. So here's that warehouse web interface. You can see I've added a lot of variants over time here. Here are those projects that we were looking at. Here are those reports. Um, and here's those assessment catalogs. And we were just querying one of these. Let's go query one of these projects. I mentioned I added my my samples to this panel of 5,000 before. Um, so let's say I wanted to do something uh, common, like let's just go and extract my five samples out of this whole catalog, but only look at rare sort of interesting functional variants. So to do that, um, this is a bit of a, a, a kitchen sink of annotations. You can, you can configure it to show or hide as many annotations as you like, um, but I'm going to uh, do that standard uh, look at the effect of a variant on a gene, apply this as a filter. You can see this filter interface is pretty much the same whether you're in your assessment catalogs, your reports, variants, or your projects. Um, and I'm also going to look at rare variants by uh, exact and upper bound of 0.1. So very quickly I'm, I'm going through these very large warehouse projects and finding the interesting variants to me. Um, and I might want to also include functional predictions, things like uh, these functional predictions. This is a voting algorithm where it takes all these six different functional prediction algorithms, says how many of them 
are, are like to predict it as pathogenic, so uh, more than half of them there. So I have 11,000 interesting variants. And then again, I wanted to say, oh, but I only care about variants that are in just my samples. So let's look at variants. So this is an entire matrix of all samples, all variants. Um, I only want to look at variants that have a zygosity that are not referenced, so homozygous or heterozygous. And I have all 5,000 samples here. Easy way of selecting these, you can kind of click if you want, um, is to define a cohort. I previously defined a cohort. These are very easy to, to set up. Uh, just the five samples from my project. So now I have these five samples, apply that filter. Very quickly, I'm down to 40 variants. So I've queried this, this massive repository of variants, getting down to the 38 interesting ones. You can see quickly some of these have uh, ClinVar assertions. I could drill down on that, but I just want to do a quick export. Um, so I'm going to run the export tool, we can dump to Excel, we can dump to um, TSV or VCF, so this contains everything you need to do analysis. Um, we'll go ahead and select the right cohort here, five samples, and then I want to, I don't want all these extra fields, but I do want to maybe grab, just read depth and alt to low frequency, etc. Let's dump this to Excel so we have that nicely formatted Excel thing. Remember, Varseek is powering this, so that same Excel export we were doing from Varseek is now being essentially run as a command line process. These exports can be long. We can export, you know, you can you can dump a VCF of every single variant in here, and every you can dump this entire warehouse to a VCF. It might take uh, a couple uh, tens of minutes or even an hour if you're talking about whole genomes, etc. So we create this as a little job, um, and then this is already done here, and then we give you a permanent link to download the results of that. Um, so as I pop this up. Uh, very quickly in Excel, I can see these, uh, I think it was like 38, some variants, uh, read only because I'm pulling this up multiple times, and we have that, all those hyperlinks, all those comments, all that great information, um, and plus the whole matrix of uh, sample data uh, here as well. All right, so in about the remaining 10 minutes that I want for the presentation, touch on the final uh, note about big data with Golden Helix, and this is looking at it from our research platform, SIP and Variation Suite. So this is our very mature analytics platform designed for large data sets from the beginning, and so we don't care if those large data sets have large numbers of samples or a large number of markers, and now those are often called variants. Um, and we've seen a lot of growth in the agrogenomics industry, especially as they're pushing the limit of their breeding programs to include tens of thousands of samples. A lot of the statistical algorithms here are being run in a, a way where we're sort of touching, you know, not just, um, uh, you know, we don't care about just the number of samples, but we're computing things like genomic relationship matrices on every sample compared to every sample, and those matrices now are end by end in size. Uh, you, quick math, if you take 100,000, square that, and you have some amount of per cell, you know, four bytes or so, you're now getting into hundreds of gigabytes of RAM required just to hold, a, you know, a single instance of these matrices, and that seems completely impossible to, to run on, on standard desktop hardware. Uh, my machine here is, you know, a three-year-old, nothing fancy, three-year-old desktop with eight gigs of RAM, um, a very powerful machine, but I certainly wouldn't be able to, to work with those data sizes if that constraint was, was there. Um, the types of math we're doing here, I don't want to get into too much here. We got a blog post that covers this, and I want some time for questions. But we essentially need to take these matrices to compute um, these allele substitution effects based on the GBLOP algorithm. We want these to be able to predict breeding values, estimated breeding values, which really help you, you know, narrow down, you know, which of your uh, um, essentially whatever you're doing breeding or your flock or your your herd. Um, which sires you want to sort of move forward in a breeding program, et cetera. So very popular, very value, valuable in analytics, but potentially limited by just the inherent nature of these large matrices. Um, so what we did is we used a couple of tricks, every trick in the book we can come up with, um, but most of it is based on um, this ability to do an adaptive um, or an approximation of these large decomposition uh, linear algebra structures and do it in a piecewise manner with smaller matrices and use a lot of out-of-memory scratch buffers. And this allows this in to, with a little trade-off in time versus memory, um, you can now run these computations on these very large data sets 
they would essentially be inaccessible before. Um, so without further ado, and I'm not going to use this as a full-blown intro to SVS, but we are going to sort of just give you a sense of what this looks like. SVS is a very uh, spreadsheet-oriented tool, um, so if I wanted to predict uh, these 8,000 samples, I would run the genomic, I would go to our, we have various different, you know, workflows, analytics, it's all built into our menus here. We would run our prediction algorithm. This prediction algorithm needs to have your pre-computed allele substitution effects from a model that you've computed off of another spreadsheet. This is those spread, this is the example of those spreadsheets that would potentially completely fall over in a large uh, large end setting. We have 200,000 samples by 200,000 samples. Well, let's run GBLOP now um, and not run the whole thing because that would take some time, but we do have these trade-offs in terms of if you want a little more precision versus uh, uh, speed. And now when I run this, um, it certainly takes some time to start doing the scanning, um, but then we do these iterative passes and we would actually compute these full matrices and then you can use that in your uh, downstream prediction tools. So very exciting. We have a lot of uh, interest in, in, in scaling in that sense as well. Okay, so to wrap this up, I wanted to touch on the fact that, you know, you, we've been looking at the upper bounds here. Um, is this still applicable to you if you are just getting started, you're running a couple gene panels, um, you know, you expect to get a couple samples a month or even tens of samples a month? Um, and the, the answer is absolutely. We've been seeing a lot of interest in warehouse in that use case, and we've decided to really uh, make sure that we don't have just a one-size-fit-all uh, solution in terms of licensing warehouse, and we're going to be talking about about that in the next month or so. We're going to make sure that there are smaller lab packages um, that make sense. Um, whether you are a small lab or a research group with just a number of users, um, being able to aggregate samples, have a way to share and collaborate this data, keeping the, you know, uh, again, treasuring your samples so you have those those frequencies of how often things appear in your um, high quality clinical samples as opposed to just the the research population catalogs that are out there. Um, core labs have also looked at this in the sense that they can um, as a single uh, point of contact, they can start to collect populations that are larger than any individual research group they may serve, and those population frequencies can essentially be more than the sum of their parts, even though you might have one research group studying autism and another study, you know, some other types of inherited diseases, altogether you have quite a few uh, exomes or genomes that would benefit everybody to have in a controlled access, and we do have the ability to say, um, allow this user to access this this resource on the warehouse, but not this resource, and so that is something um, we see as well. And finally, consortiums uh, were being written into a number of grants to be able to handle um, cross institution consortiums. You can put this on a cloud server. Um, it can be a place that is publicly accessible with a secure with a secure access uh, with an encrypted connection. We have a case study uh, where this is being used by Bohi alum in a very similar way where they're uh, looking for a specific aggregation of samples um, for their, uh, to have ethnically matched samples for their analysis. So uh, take a look at our case studies and we are going to be uh, announcing how we're going to make sure that this is accessible no matter where you are in terms of how large your own data sets are. In reality, uh, public data sets are large. You still need to have technology that can scale and scales with you as you grow. Um, so with that, let's let's uh, use the last couple minutes to um, take questions. Um, man, I'm excited I stayed somewhat on time there. Um, so I do hope, I, I do love questions and uh, I'd love to, to be able to answer them now. Um, so I'll let Cheryl ask those and and as she's doing that, I'll try to do a little bit of uh, flagging so we can cover as much of those as possible. In reality, we're not going to be able to touch on all these that are coming in. I can see them coming in. Uh, so what we'll probably do is have a blog post to, to wrap up uh, or to summarize and follow up with some of these questions as well. Um, and I can also certainly uh, contact you individually if you have uh, more uh, in-depth questions. Thank you, Gabe. Um, Questions, feel free to enter them now. We'll get to as many as we can. A um, <clears throat> couple of quick announcements from me. Uh, of course, the webcast recording and slides will be up on our website. Um, 
maybe tomorrow, but more than likely Friday. Um, and I'll email them out to you, so keep an eye on your inbox. Um, our next webcast will be coming up on October 12th and invites for that will be going out tomorrow. Um, that will be covering a new copy number algorithm in the works at Golden Helix for variant analysis. Um, if you're attending ASHG this year, please come by and say hi. Of course, we're going to be there. You'll find us in booth 902, right inside the front doors. Um, I just received boxes of some brand new t-shirt designs. And in the next few weeks, you'll see a blog post uh, listing our official demo times where you can come and grab those. And, and they are and awesome, let me say. <laughs> they are awesome. I, I've been we're wearing my... ourselves on the back here. Awesome. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, so that's it for me. Let's get to those questions. <clears throat> what is the end goal for an application like Warehouse? Uh, well, the end goal is to essentially uh, to scale with the needs of labs. So whether that's integrating with uh, your existing other lab systems, uh, uh, LIMS, EMRs, um, scaling to the, the needs of small labs, large labs, um, and different types of uh, different types of groups. So research institutions versus more clinical settings. Um, so this is uh, we've certainly seen a lot of progress just in this last year in terms of adoption and, and how we've been scaling this, and it's not the end of the story. When do you see the move from clinical whole exomes to clinical whole genomes unfolding? Well, I, th I think it's uh, you know it is a matter of cost, um, but also a matter of people's comfort with the uh, being able to handle the data. Uh, it is quite a few. Uh, it is a, quite a, a massive increase in terms of just data size that you start with. You're talking about instead of looking at you know. Uh, tens of thousands or a hundred thousand variants in an exome, um, tens of millions of variants. Um, as you can see, Varsity can certainly handle that. Um, but in terms of uh, price curve, you know, I, I, I think it's flatlined a little bit. There's no one who's really pushing Illumina to they don't have to go any lower because they're already ahead of the game in terms of their competition. So I'd love to see some pressure on them. Um, but over time, you do see their 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 incrementally improving their chemistry and with the HiSeq X, um, the reagent cost of whole genomes is now less than a thousand. Of course the all-in cost is more than that, but with that sort of growth and trend, um, it's only a matter of time. I would say within five years it would be, uh, I'd be surprised if we're not analyzing genomes more commonly. Impressive technology, but I run a small lab. Do you have versions of your software that will fit into an affordable budget. Yes, as I mentioned, we'll we'll talk about more about those packages in the next couple of months. Um, we do license on a subscription model based on the number of active users, the number of users who will be accessing and using the tool. So, as you saw, everything is authenticated. We know we we want to make sure we are properly. Um, logging, you know, which user is performing which analysis, updating which annotation, authoring which report. Um, so if you just have a small lab with a number, you know, one or two users, we're going to make sure we have a package available for you. Are these features available in your software now? If not, when are they going to be available? Yeah, absolutely. They're available now, and uh, we have we're ready to set you up to evaluate Warehouse. We can run it on a demo version on our our cloud, um, and it is something that you can also then in implementation install locally. Um, I see one other question about that: uh, whether it's a, a a service that's only on Golden Helix servers or whether it can set up locally. Um, the option is either, or uh, you can run it on your own cloud. You can run it on your own local hardware. Uh, it has a very straightforward uh, installation process. Uh, I've helped internal IT teams install it in less than an hour, and 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 same with Varseek. Varseek is able to be run uh, locally using your own compute as well. What is the approximate maximum number of VCF files that Varseek can analyze simultaneously? 
Right, so we only ever need to touch the raw VCFs when we do our initial import, and we've, we've worked hard to scale that to essentially not be an upper bound. Um, so obviously there is as much time as it takes to read all the files, um, but even when we start to hit the number of open files that are available to an, a, a given operating system, we essentially just uh, do a divide and conquer and, and uh, bring in as many files as we can in one pass and then merge the remaining stuff. So uh, essentially unbounded, and we're excited that some some people are, are really pushing those limits. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Are the Varseek and Warehouse ready for livestock? So that's a great question. We showed you know a lot of human genetics uh, and human annotations, uh, but there are annotations in our repository uh, across all model organisms, and especially a lot in the uh, agriculture um, space. We have we have cow, we have chicken, we have etc. And so all of our tools are aware of which assembly, which reference assembly, um, the variants are are aligned to, and of course then only the annotations appropriate are brought in. Um, so certainly there's a lot of the clinical workflow stuff that doesn't make sense in that type of workflow, but warehouse can handle all of your, uh, your, your, your samples regardless of where they're coming from. We do currently uh, only import NGS variants from VCF files, GVCF files, um, that standardized format. Um, but we can certainly get them in um, to to Varsic and to Warehouse if you have um, a whole bunch of ag uh, samples. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. Okay, we are sounds good. Approaching 11, those questions are still trickling in. I'm going to leave the webinar open so that if you do have a few more questions, feel free to, um, to enter them in and we will get in touch with you um, regarding those. Um, we'll also cap some of them in a blog post tomorrow. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. We appreciate it, and we will see you next time. Have a great day. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks.